Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. I am very much looking forward to spending a few days talking about rereading. I plan to do the fantastic rereading tag that Roz at Scally Dandling About the Books put together, and also make a video comparing a couple of books about rereading published this year, and how they made me think about my father. Today, though, I want to celebrate Steve Donahue's tradition of reading and of rereading The Odyssey every August. And, of course, celebrate the work of Homer himself and the amazing variety of translators who have approached his work. I think I'll be making a couple of videos about The Odyssey, maybe over the next year, but today I want to talk about two things. The personality of Odysseus, the main character of the Odyssey, and the ways assorted translators have portrayed him. In the opening of Homer's The Odyssey, the main character, Odysseus, is described with the Greek word polytropos. You can sort of guess at the meaning, even those of us who know no Greek, by playing through words with similar roots. Words like polygon and polygamous and tropical and troposphere. A very literal translation might be taking many turns or much traveled. But the phrase taking many turns has a variety of metaphoric meanings as well. Robert Fagels translates the word to say Odysseus is a man of twists and turns. He's a wandering man, but he's also a man who is multifaceted, who is clever, who is wily perhaps, maybe even duplicitous. In the very first lines of his other extant epic, the Iliad, Homer points to two major themes that will be central to that epic, the rage of Achilles and the glory promised by heroic death and war. We're left thinking about the meaning of being mortal, unlike the gods. That is, we're left thinking about the fact that humans die. In the Odyssey, we turn to a story of what happens after war, that is the story of peace, Interestingly, I think we're again thinking about the meaning of being mortal, unlike the gods, but this time we're not thinking about death per se, but about what humanity means. Today I want to talk about some of the themes of the Odyssey, highlighted by Homer's use of the word polytropus in these first critical lines. First, the central drive of the Odyssey is Odysseus's efforts to return home to his wife and child, Odithaca. This turning, or rather returning, is the specific story of an individual. But clearly Homer is comparing the return of Odysseus to the homecomings of other war heroes. From other literature and mythology, we know what becomes of other leaders from the long years at Troy. By the time the Odyssey begins, however, all the other warriors are either home or dead, or both, as you might think about if you're reading early Greek drama. Only Odysseus has not yet returned home. The former warrior's homecoming is threatened and delayed constantly by the vagaries of fortune and the vengeance of gods or the missteps of his crew. That is, Odysseus' attempts to return home are thwarted by twists and turns, leading him from one danger to another, from one delay to further delay. A final meaning of polytropus that I see is the twists and turns of his own mind. Odysseus was praised in the Iliad for being one of the Greeks' best warriors, not because of his physical strength, but because of his intelligence. Perhaps intelligence is the wrong word. Instead, we might call Odysseus crafty or conniving or tricky. In a future video, I might talk more about this aspect of Odysseus, how his cleverness is echoed in other characters, and what Homer might have meant by it. Anyway, the Greek word polytropos, weighted with these various meanings, creates both a complication and an opportunity for translators. Here are a few of their various attempts at conveying the polytropic nature of Odysseus. First, here's the translation by Robert Fagels, published in 1996. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course. Alan Mandelbaum, published in 1990. 
Muse, tell me of the man of many wiles, the man who wandered many paths of exile. Richard Lattimore from 1965. Tell me, Muse, of the man of many ways who was drawn of our journeys. Robert Fitzgerald, published in 1961. Sing in me, Muse, and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways of contending, the wanderer harried for years on end. Rieu and Rieu, which was originally translated in the mid-1940s and more recently revised by the translator's son. Tell me, Muse, the story of that very resourceful man who was driven to wander far and wide. Next, Samuel Butler from 1900. Tell me, O oh Muse, of that ingenious hero who traveled far and wide. And finally, Alexander Pope from 1725. The man for wisdom's various arts renowned, long exercised in woes, O oh Muse, resound. Depending on which translator we read, Odysseus might be wily or ingenious, cunning or resourceful. Clearly, some of these words are more negative than others, but even when we use the most positive words, it's very hard to conceive of the hero of the Odyssey as a man really trying to live by his moral compass. When I think of the meanings of the word turning, my thoughts sometimes turn to Pete Seeger's soundtrack featuring Turn, 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 and its lyrics straight from the King James translation of Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. In the Odyssey, Homer takes the turn mentioned at the end of this passage, from a time of war to a time of peace. Other than that, the words of the Bible and the words of Homer are radically different. Homer is not engaging with the complex message of the acceptance of change that seems to be coming out of Ecclesiastes. Instead, we have a story, albeit with a somewhat convoluted and twisting narrative structure, of a journey with a clear beginning and a foreordained end. In other words, the turning stops when the book stops. Religious ideas about turning also appear in the Jewish concept of teshuva, one of the central conceits of Yom Kippur. The literal meaning of teshuva actually is turning, but the Hebrew word carries the idea of repentance as well. Teshuva only comes when we turn away from lives of dishonesty or injustice and turn towards a commitment to a changed self. Teshuva requires that we acknowledge our limits and our weaknesses and take responsibility for our past actions. Is this kind of turning that is furthest from what we see in these translations of the Odyssey? Odysseus uses lies and deceit to trick monsters and gods and good people alike. He brags about his strengths and tries to erase any perceived cases of weaknesses or fault. He blames the men of his crew for many of their setbacks. He even lies and cheats his way into his own palace at Ithaca. And yet... Homer makes sure his listeners and readers are cheering for Odysseus all the way to the end. His lack of change or thought almost makes Odysseus seem like a cartoon figure, a character with no depth and no change. 
Although I'm stunned to say it, the Iliad resonates for me as a modern reader far more than the Odyssey does. Achilles struggles through such intense personal growth that the book feels like a very modern and meaningful book in some ways, at least at some points. The Odyssey, especially in some translations, occasionally feels more like a bad superhero adventure story, entertaining but not necessarily transformative. Let me share one more contemporary-ish turning song, another religious one, this time the Shaker one. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Many of the lines of this hymn fit fairly well with the Odyssey. In fact, Odysseus's main goal is return to the place he ought to be, at least the place other people might think he ought to be. But does he learn to turn to true simplicity? Perhaps learning to be simple is exactly the lesson he needs to learn. Odysseus has been used to being the war hero who everyone celebrated. Now he has to return home to be a family man, a normal, plain life, rather than the exciting, dangerous world of war. Perhaps struggling through all the twists and turns of his journey helps him conceive of himself as something other than a warrior. These times of imprisonment or punishment turn him into a nobody, as we see quite pointedly in Book 9. Odysseus rejects the possibilities of immortality and embraces a desire to return home to the valley of love and delight instead, at least at some level. What I'm not so sure of is whether, in the end, Odysseus actually learns these lessons of simple connection to family. Which makes me think of Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Odysseus sits like an idle king by the still hearth among these barren crags matched with an aged wife and struggles with how dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. Tennyson doesn't suspect that his hero is settling down for long. Okay, there are still three translations I still want to discuss, at least briefly. Works done by Stanley Lombardo, Stephen Mitchell, and Emily Wilson. First, Stanley Lombardo. Speak memory of the cunning hero, the wanderer, blown off course time and again. Lombardo replaces the more traditional muse with memory, a choice that translates not only Homer's words, but his meaning into a modern idiom. Instead of an external, supernatural figure shaping the text, the story emerges from within, from Homer's memories, from our memories. The phrase also emphasizes the importance of the preservation of memory in Odysseus's own story. Lombardo takes the words from the title of Nabokov's memoir, his own reckoning with both the past and what the past has meant to him over time. Fascinatingly, it's a phrase which Nabokov uses partially in reference to Homer. The echo of an echo makes me feel like I'm opening a series of Russian dolls or something. Anyway, Lombardo makes another modern reference in his choice of cover art. We see NASA's Earthrise, a picture taken by astronauts on an Apollo mission as they looked back from space to our planet. The image reminds us how much our world calls to us, even when we seem unbelievably far from home. It also emphasizes how much we're pulled away from home by the idea of journey. That is, we feel the pull to make our own odysseys. Lombardo calls Odysseus cunning, but at the same time, the translator uses language that stresses that something else controls his travels home. He's, quote, blown off course time and again. Stephen Mitchell's translation of the phrase casts Odysseus in the same light. Sing to me, muse, of that endlessly cunning man who was blown off course to the ends of the earth. 
Compare those portrayals to Emily Wilson's translation of the passage. I promise I'll come back to her full translation at some point, possibly pairing it with a translation by women of the Iliad and the Aeneid. But for now, let's look at just this first piece. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost. These words, like so much of Wilson's translation, are almost plain. Minimalist, maybe. Clean is probably a better word. Unlike Lombardo and Mitchell, Wilson does not say that Odysseus was blown off course. We hear that he was at least partially to blame for getting lost. Wilson's text as a whole casts Odysseus as an actor rather than a victim of forces completely beyond his control. And then, still in the first few lines, she writes that he tries but cannot save his compatriots. And later we hear that, quote, he failed to keep them safe. This emphasis on his own weakness and his own culpability is not always present in previous translations. It makes the Odyssey conform a bit more, I think, to what modern readers might expect from novels. Fate does not control the lives of contemporary fictional characters. Honestly, I think that would invalidate the whole project of the novel. Wilson's Odysseus makes choices and decisions in the various situations in which he finds himself that make him a more developed character by contemporary standards. Even her translation of him not as cunning but as complicated underlines this approach, I think. Well, I have a lot more to say about Wilson and also Mitchell, but let me end today with the way Emily Wilson translates the end of that first call to the muse to sing. Many translators more or less call for the goddess child of Zeus to, as Mitchell writes, begin now wherever you wish to and tell the story again for us. Or, as Lombardo says, tell the tale once more in our time. I really love Wilson's translation, because even more than Lombardo's, it echoes what new translators are seeking to do. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. Thanks for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.